Well, hi everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the last in our In Conversation with webinar series. Um, I'm gonna plan these out in April. I thought we'd do them throughout the month of May. That feels like about three days ago, so I'm not entirely sure how an entire month <laughs> has shot by, but it has. Um, the last one of the series is with Abby, Abby Knight, who joins us today. Hi, Abby. Hi there, how are you doing? How are you doing? Um, Abby, is, is your um, volume on your audio on? Uh, it's... Yep, there you are. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. I turned it off and on again ah. like you should do to fix any issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it literally fixes absolutely everything. Yeah. How are you doing? How um, How's lockdown yeah, life been treating you? Yeah, not bad. I mean, you can't complain about the weather, right? So it puts everyone in a great mood. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, yeah, that's true. Um, I sat outside for 20 minutes yesterday and got a big red patch down my face, which I've had to cover up in makeup today, so there'll be a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. Can't tell, can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, also, if you've been on a webinar... Lockdown is, it's, it, sorry, I'm talking over you now. I'm just also very excited that lockdown... Is that lockdown um, is, um, things are opening up and that makes me feel a lot more positive as well. Yeah. Do you know, honestly, I, I was saying the other day, it feels like the change that's coming post lockdown is just going to happen so rapidly. I think everybody is so, so, so desperate for it um, that there's no kind of easing back out of it as much as obviously the rules are around easing everybody's going to kind of take that rule to the absolute extreme of it and kind of get as much out of it as they possibly can. And, yeah, I think everybody's just ready for <laughs> to put the last few months behind us, pretty much. Exactly, exactly. So we um, the, the philosophy around this series of webinars, for those who um, maybe not joined in the last couple of weeks, was that we had our conference next month. Yep, 3rd of June, next week it would have been, next Wednesday. Um, the conference was all around evolution and looking at how financial services is evolving or already was um, expected to evolve prior to you know what's happened the world shutting down and um, actually what's then happened is we think that evolution has still happened but even faster than we even yeah. could have possibly imagined it would have done at the start of the year um, and so the initial kind of conversations that have been asking oh and also just to say as well that um, the chat box is there, so please feel free to pop any messages and questions in as we go along. We'll try and kind of pick them up as we see them. If we miss any, then we'll follow up afterwards, and it is all being recorded. So um, it's available to watch back too. Um, but yeah, the the kind of starting question, I guess, for everybody, Abby, that I've been asking people is, assuming the last three months of madness didn't happen, um, what was your original intention? What were you going to talk about at the Evolution Conference next week? Okay, so interestingly, I was talking about marketing in the age of disruption, and um, it doesn't get more disruptive than this. So. <laughs> but essentially, what I was going to tackle is um, more so around the fact that um, we're living in an age of disruption. And if you read what the commentators in our profession um, frequently cite, you're going to start to think, well, maybe robos are going to take over the world or everything's going to go digital. And so what I wanted to do is kind of challenge that notion and concept and start to really explore, well, whether you believe we are at the dawn of a new era or you believe that there's no threat to face-to-face -face advice, how are advisors using digital and tech in order to streamline their service delivery, be more effective in their marketing? And really, what does the business business model of the future start to look like if we all start to embrace technology in you know the best way possible um so what I did is I created a big like Prezi you know I love my Prezi's um so I created a Prezi presentation um where I kind of looked at those kind of issues should I dive in and show you what that looked like absolutely yeah yeah so have you got kind of what it, what it was going to look like what it was going to look like and then I'm going to talk about how it would change now Perfect. so here it is here. Um, this is basically my introductory um, kind of slide, which essentially is an overview of the entire presentation. So what I intended to focus on is um, where advisors add the most value and kind of this continuum of human led advice so 100 percent face to face to technology led advice and everything in between. Um, additionally, I was going to look at propositions and kind of, you know, what is product or investment led style propositions versus behavioral and efficiency led propositions. And where are the biggest added value is for advisors in delivering um, their services to clients and um, really what clients are looking for as well. So changes in consumer behavior, 
um, AI, what that's going to do for the profession, um, looking right through the advisors process of everything that they do from onboarding to fact finding um, and all of the tools that we have in our armory and how we can use them more efficiently. Um, and then I was also going to look at a bit about like predictive intervention and algo trading and, you know, a whole blockchain and a whole host of other like highly tech things. But what I then wanted to do um, was talk about it in a marketing context. Um, so start to look at, well, what does this mean for your marketing and communication strategy? And um, really, what does it mean for your client experience? Because in my view, that's where the true battleground is today. It's not the products and services that we sell. It's all about the client experience that we deliver because products and services, as you know, are becoming highly commoditized. So really, what does that mean and how do we differentiate ourselves? I had lots of examples as well from the retail sector um, and um, also examples of what advisors have been doing, you know, with the launch of their own apps and their online um, kind of client experiences and, you know, basically how they've been going through that journey. So um, well, oh, <laughs> sorry, like did it um, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. <laughs> um, Talking of tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you were very, very prepared for um, the event. So, um, yeah, then the world turned upside down, which is why, do you know, I don't recommend that everybody is as last minute as I am. Um, but if you were as last minute as I am, then you wouldn't spend a huge amount of time on something. <laughs> Damn, all those hours wasted. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, as you say, the actual topic then, actually, whatever you'd kind of built to that point, talking about disruption and, yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about disruption and um, and actually, so in the webinar series that we've done, the first one was with Neil Moles, who's CEO of Progeny mm -hmm. Group, and um, I saw a quote from him this week, which was um, an article that they'd done kind of following on and sort of after the, the webinar that we did, where he said, overnight, we've become a technology firm that delivers advice, so literally flips it completely on its head rather than being an advice firm that used bits of technology. They, they, you know, they've become a tech yeah. firm, so yeah. I'm guessing that's kind of looking at that um, that axis that you had there where you went from human-led to technology-led. There'll be a lot of advice firms that are exactly doing that. It's kind of accelerated them from one end to the other. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, so really what the takeaway was is how can advisors embrace technology to deliver services in new and innovative ways. Um, but additionally saying that the face-to-face -face element is never going to go away. And that's where the real value add is for advisors. So they still need to be operating that space. And irrespective of what some market commentators will have you believe in that when never everything's going to be online forever, the whole world is going digital, completely disagree. You know, as we were talking before we started, everyone is just dying to get out of lockdown and we are going to revert to behaviors that we um, adopted before. Exactly. So the um, last week's webinar was with Neil Birch and um, he was saying exactly that. He said that while society evolves very, very quickly, actually as a species, our evolution is years, you know, it takes a millennium for us to kind of get to where we are. So um, that human need, that interaction, that's that's not going away overnight, regardless of what's, what's happened very, very recently. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So if the um, if the conference was happening next week, um, you know, if I could wave a wand and we had a hall that was guaranteed to be COVID nineteen free, and we could all get together, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, if I could wave a wand to do that, I probably would use my magic power to run a conference. To be honest, probably yeah. apply it to a bar. Um, but if um, if I did do it for a conference and you were around and able to present, what? How do you think that would have changed? Have you kind of um, looked at would it be much different to what you were going to talk about how, how would your presentation uh, I think what I would have done is added in a whole load more examples around um, you know case studies around how businesses have been adapting um, to the changes um, also talking about consumer needs and preferences and um, how the way we consume services has changed and I think will continue to do so um, I've also been um, looking at you know one of the key messages from my last presentation is around we live in the age of authenticity and people want to connect with people. We don't want to see any cheese in marketing. We don't want to have any um, just broad generalizations or, you know, things talking about, oh, our values are X, but they're not actually delivering on those values in the execution yeah. of services. Um, so I think that um, I would have changed it to go into a bit more depth on the age of authenticity and what that means. Um, but then, what I'd like to talk about today is actually um, more around what people got wrong in their marketing um, during 
during COVID um, and then also um, what brands are doing and what we can do can, and continue to do as we move out of this because I think that's probably a more benefit to listeners today um, than um, you know just kind of touching it on a high level because I think there's some funny things that have happened as I'm sure you've experienced as well. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, and yeah I think it's absolutely perfect timing because I think as we've come into the end of this series and you know schools or some of the schools are starting back on Monday and there is very much that sense of starting to come out the other side. So, you know, we looked at the beginning of the series of how we dealt with going into lockdown. Um, yeah. We've looked at how people have managed kind of through it and what it means for us personally in our behaviours. And, um, yeah, I think kind of looking at exactly what you said there, what, what maybe could have been done better during and how we can start to look forward would be great. So, um, yeah. do you want to? I'll just pass it over to you. Actually, <laughs> you've got some, some specifics. Okay. Um, <laughs> so basically, um, none of us could have predicted the pandemic and the impact that it would have. Um, but what it has done is it's highlighted the inefficiencies that a lot of us have had in our businesses and how we should be rectifying those. Um, and I think that we're going to see more focus on that. And that's why there's this movement towards um, digital. Um, but basically, what we've seen is like this whole concept of authenticity really come to the fore. And um, people don't want to be marketed to and they don't want to be sold to they want to connect to you and they want to connect to your brand so we have to kind of reframe and reposition the way that we're articulating not only what we do um, but how we're benefiting our clients and what value our service really delivers um, i found it really really funny um, to read in the times i think it was last weekend or the weekend before um, the journalist was basically saying i do not want you to be my friend if you are a bank <laughs> just get your service right <laughs> because what a lot of brands have tried to do yeah. is you know I'll give you a big warm hug and and you know it's a wonderful time you know to work with us because we're caring about you no just sort out your service levels I don't care yes, about yeah. you know, friends. Friends. got enough friends that I can't say <laughs> friends. exactly right exactly right and then what happened was a lot of people then started coming out and saying oh, but we're with you during these times and, you know, um, let's stay together and stay safe and, and all of that. And I think people just lost the plot in their marketing. I think it was quite funny because some really big brands um, had some successful failures, <laughs> as in like big failures. <laughs> um, so like McDonald's, I don't know if you saw this, but McDonald's broke their arches in half to show like standing apart. Um, right. Very strange. Um or Audi went out with a um, like their rings like disconnected and all these right. brands trying to capture our attention to really emphasize this we're now standing apart and stay home and stay safe and we already knew that we were all in yes. lockdown so it was a it was a big failure um, another lesson was a lot of brands decided that their brand was so important to me whether I've engaged with it in the last five years or not that their CEO needed to send me an email and tell me you know that they cared for me. And if I get another email from a CEO talking about COVID or as we come out of lockdown, um, I really am going to scream because it's not authentic. And often I'm on a list from like five or even 10 years ago um, where that proposition has no relevance to me right now. So you're just clogging up my inbox. So yeah, that, I've had, yeah, I've had so many of those there. and it's exactly that. It's kind of, um, it's those mailing lists where you forgot that you were on them. And the reason you forgot that you were on them is because they've not been in touch with you at all over all this time. So actually you were there as, as data that they could have been doing some good marketing to, they could have been engaged with you at any point. Um, and you're right instead, the only time you hear from them is during this with a very inauthentic message, which makes you go, why am I still on that list? I'll unsubscribe. Exactly. It's, Exactly. And that's like the marketing fails that I've seen. And I think that one lesson that we can learn from this is really get to grips with your data. I think now that we've hit the pause button, we've got a little bit of time to think about our strategies and the tactics we're going to deploy. We need to really think, well, how can I get my data in really good shape so that I can push the right messages to the right people at the right times? Um, you know, I just feel like that is something that has, has been quite lost and we've really realized that and it's come to the fore um, over recent weeks. Um, there's also a whole bunch of research that's come out basically saying that those brands that came out with COVID related messaging um, that completely missed the mark are actually um, d doing brand damage rather than, mm -hmm. you know, those, those products and propositions that have gone out and said, you know what, how can I continue to market through this time in a way that's relevant to my audience? And, um, you know, a specific example of this, I've got a tweet here and it's so funny. Um, I laughed out loud when I read this one. Um, it's a marketeer who I follow and he basically said, so 
do all the brands now have to make a stay home Corona ad? Um, because I just saw one for cheese and I'm really confused. <laughs> Can't you just show me an ad for cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that when you were talking about the, the mistakes earlier, there's the first one I saw, I can't remember who it was, but the first one I saw, I think it was one of the banks, and it was the stay at home, and it was a nice message, and it was everybody recording themselves, and we're still here for you, and I remember thinking, oh, that's really nice, that's really well done, and then I've seen a variation of that just over and over and over. <laughs> Exactly. Not for cheese. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, some of the fails I saw as well was um, a handbag manufacturer, like on, you know, the first week of lockdown, basically, I've not bought from them in about four or five years. So if they'd clean their data, they would know this. And it basically said, um, it's a designer handbag firm who will remain like, nameless. Um, we will continue our service chain is her you know, basically, nothing has been disrupted, and we'll still be able to deliver handbags during this time. If I'm worried about a global pandemic, the safety of my family, um, you know, all of that, the economic situation, everything, um, I'm not concerned about a designer handbag. So that was like an epic fail. Yeah. However, <laughs> I did have some really good emails from financial advisors uh, at the start and c continued throughout. So here's who's doing it well. Some advisors, um, one of the best emails I got was on about day three after London got locked down. And this um, advisor basically said to me, oh, you know, said to all of his clients, um, what I want you to know is during this time, this is how our service levels will be interrupted. So we're all working remotely. We've made sure that our staff are, are keeping safe. Um, and, you know, there are going to be some delays. And here are alternative ways to contact us. Here are mobile numbers for everyone. Um, and basically made me feel confident that if I'm a client of theirs, I'll be able to have access and nothing's going to stop. It's like uninterrupted service, just maybe a few delays. But then yeah. what they did, which I thought was quite clever, was they then said, so you're in lockdown. Here are five things you can concentrate on. How about that home renovation project? How about keeping fit? These are the books we'll be reading, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, wow, that's great. Um, because they've also thought about their audience and they've given them kind of books that they know that they'd be interested in. Um, they've given links to apps to download and things like that. And I thought that's quite clever. The following week, that same planner sends another email saying, so um, we've got a webinar this week and we're going to be talking about X topic. Um, but additionally, we want to show you what our team is getting up to during lockdown. And so each week they've been focusing on a different team member and what they're doing, you know, one's doing a garden re renovation project. Um, there's another one that's learning to cook um, and showing dishes and all that. And now the clients are involved and they're sharing what they're doing. And so it's giving it this real community style feel. And I think that that's quite nice because it makes you think, well, actually, that's a brand that I want to do business with because they're really thinking about their people. And it's a very people focused message rather than being anything to do with, um, you know, a cheesy stay home, stay safe. It's like actually giving you kind of practical tools and remaining in constant contact. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah, and but also I've had a number of advisors call me in the last few weeks saying, "I'm I'm going into meltdown. I just don't know what to talk about. Like I'm done. I, I've got nothing to talk about." We've in the first week we called all of our clients. Those that we've put into a, a specific like cell, if you will, that are overly concerned that need more handholding, we're in regular contact contact with them. We've run about six webinars. Um, but we've run out of things to talk about. Um, and I think, well, actually, that's, you know, you can't run out of things to talk about. There's so much to talk about right now if you know your audience and you know your data. You know, you could start to bring in um, an osteo to talk about um, working from home in good posture. I mean, we're probably coming out the other side now, so it's a bit late. Um, or maybe a local chef could be doing like a cooking demonstration or something like that. You could still be doing that as well as building a library of all of those questions that clients have been asking um, that are basically aligned to their concerns and then running additional webinars on those topics. Like um, I've been furloughed. What does that mean for my pension, for example? Mm -hmm. Or I'm a small business owner and I've taken out these various government um, initiatives. What does that mean for my business in 12 months time and how can I plan for that? So there's still a whole load of content that you can still deliver, but it's about getting the right frequency, which I still believe should be weekly, um, getting the right medium. So I still think that video is quite good. Um, but also if you're going to do um, video and you've got some clients that are not that into it, but they'll read something, you know, transcribe it and send it to them in an email. And you shouldn't get frightened of over communicating in a time like this because not all of your audience is going to be reading every communication that you send. 
So you could invite them to a webinar this Friday, next Friday, um, and then only 10% take you up on that. But then you can take that webinar and you can send it to all of your clients and say, just in case someone you know is interested in this, um, here's the transcript, transcribed version, for example, and here's the webinar link. Um, share it with your friends and family or anyone you know that has this um, concern or fear or is interested in this topic. Um, and then that way you're actually sending positive mes messages out to the market. You're creating a load of content that's on your side that even new clients that don't know you, if they land on there, they'll be able to, um, to get access to that and see how much you're helping people in the crisis. Um, and I think it's one of the things that you said as well was around actually knowing your data as well. So the examples you were given, um, you know, if, if people were employed or if they were, um, you know, what does furlough mean for me or um, I'm a business owner and I've used the government scheme, what does that mean? And actually knowing your clients and having really good um, accurate client data would make such a difference to the communications and the stuff that you send out to make sure that it is really relevant to them. Definitely. And also one, um, one thing that I've said to a lot of these advisors is if you don't know what your clients want to hear from you, ask them. So, you know, call around when, when you've got your team calling the different like cells of, of clients that are in, you know, that they're um, seeing as being quite vulnerable or wanting additional information, ask them what they want to hear. And you could even start, you know, using that as a Q&A that you have on your website um, for people landing there and keep directing people back to it. Um, there's a lot that you can do. And if you, your data isn't up to date, start calling around now while people are available and get it up to date. Put a resource on there, even if you have to get a virtual assistant or someone in to help you, put them on it as a project to come out the other side of this, really understanding your clients and their needs and preferences. And your marketing will be so supercharged um, when, when we start to really get out there and promote ourselves again. Um, Lee's just popped a question in there, which actually is interesting. You were talking about um, those firms who were maybe thinking, I've got nothing else to talk about. But actually, what I was thinking is, for some firms, they will have communicated much more in the last few weeks. Well, actually, I think most firms will have commu communicated much more in the last few weeks than they would have normally. So actually, that in itself will feel very, um, you know, like they'll feel like they've put a lot out there and that their clients get a lot more from them than they normally do. Um, it's completely understandable and probably necessary. Um, Lee's just asked how the authenticity, how authentic that would still work. So if you were a firm that generally didn't communicate a lot and now suddenly you are, does that come across as authentic or actually does it look like you're being almost opportunistic? I think that's a really, really um, good question. And I think that those that don't communicate often will be um, very um, reticent to get out there and do all of these things that I'm saying. Um, so I would probably turn it back and do it at half speed, but I would still make sure that I've updated my website with a message that says anyone landing here, here's a Q&A of things um, that we've put together with the biggest concerns of our clients. I'd still be on the phone to those that, um, you know, I've identified as needing handholding in that regard. Um, I, yeah, so I think that it depends on what your previous strategy was. This is in an ideal world if you have been communicating. So most advisors that I know are at least sending a newsletter once a fortnight. Um, so for those firms, once a week, I don't think is going to, to the extreme. But for those firms that are... Yeah, and again, you know, we're talking, we're mainly talking financial planning firms here and um, by their very nature, they should, in theory, have been regularly communicating with clients anyway, and um, just by you know the, the nature of their service offering. Um, and if the people that they're communicating with are existing clients that are, you know they've got ongoing servicing, they're paying ongoing fees, then it sh it shouldn't come across as opportunistic. It should come across as mm. exactly what it is, kind of trying to set people's mind at ease in whichever way that you can. Um, you know, while everybody's got worries about absolutely every part of their lives, if there's one little bit that you can do to just kind of give them peace of mind, that is your financial planner, you're still there, things might change slightly in terms of communications, but otherwise everything is as it was and you're still there to kind of support them. I think that can only, only come across as a, as a positive thing. Exactly. And you can set your stall out from the beginning. So I received a really good email. Um, it was, um, it's, it's like a, um, a business, like an online um, business, they sell um, a whole, whole host of things. And they um, sent me an email and basically said, we're now going to start promoting because everyone's inboxes are flooded right now because everyone's got time to communicate. And they said, we're about to um, start promoting our Father's Day sale items. If you're not interested, click here. And so and on the same token, you could say to your clients, 
I realize this is a really difficult time for a lot of our clients. Um, if you're not interested in receiving these emails, don't worry, just send me a note saying that you don't want to hear from me in these times, but we are here on the phone. And so you can basically do that second level of permission based um, kind of exception um, acceptance before you proceed. But where I see that some firms have gotten it really wrong. So um, this is a different example, but uh, a contact of mine um, in a discretion management firm they positioned their portfolios um, in light of seeing um, a market event come down the line. And what they did is they spent probably the first month communicating every week and saying, look, our performance is starting to slip, like when it started to slip, saying, you know, but this is why, because we believe this is going, this is the impact of what's going to happen and this is how we're positioned for that. Um, you know, it's just not happening yet, so sit tight. They did the sit tight message for about a month and then they stopped doing it, but it was something like three months before that um, those positions paid off. And they had a lot of advisors and a lot of clients getting quite upset with them and saying, well, why weren't you communicating with me? Even if you're taking no action, still communicating why you're not taking any action um, is important because people want to feel like it's an active decision to take no action. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of financial planners, the message is and should be, we are in this situation, we're in it for the long term. For you, we're not to take, we're not, ta you know, you're not to take any action. Don't jump out of markets. Um, you know, I saw a funny statistic and I laughed out loud. I think it was yesterday or the day before I said just 2% of people have placed trades to get out of the market um, during these times. And I thought that's a really weird headline. So I clicked through and it's actually a self-trade platform. So these are sophisticated investors that are trading all the time. And the um, research was based on 285 people. <laughs> so I'm thinking, no, that's absolutely not right. Um, all of the other research saying that, you know, um, retirees um, drawing down income, you know, 61% of them are really concerned about how their income is affected. Um, you've got something like 41%, 44% of households that are saying they feel less financially secure right now. Um, was another one that I found there was um, a third are saying their savings have taken a hit. 16% um, say their debts have gone up. So all of this research, and this is YouGov research, um, is saying that people are actually feeling quite panicked right now and really feeling the strain. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so I think exactly that. The um, As an advisor, rather than worrying that you could over-communicate and therefore not do anything and leave people to worry, um, it's almost better to kind of put it there, give them that message. And as I said, people can always opt out. And hopefully if you've got that kind of relationship where you've got that ability to... Um, market your data in such a way and categorise it out, then you should be able yeah. to kind of hit both. So what about kind of coming out the other side of this then? What, um, what are you seeing, I guess, the stuff that we started with um, in terms of what financial services might look like? We've got this whole Project 2030 ongoing, which um, most people are aware of now, and there'll be the launch event on Monday, and that's very much based on where we think financial services is going. So what's kind of, what's your views on it? Where are you seeing it heading? Uh, I've actually got a um, a good slide that so I've been really thinking about what is the what is this recovery going to look like and and how are consumer expectations and and their um, buying behaviors and all of that how are they changing and changing forever um, so let me go into this if I can get it right uh, here we go so what I've seen is. Um, a lot of people are coming out and saying, oh, my goodness, like the world, this is going to change forever. Everything's going to go digital. And, you know, if you start to believe that, then the world will look very, very different when we come out of this thing. Um, but the one the one person that I believe has made the most sense so far in all of the resources that I've had a look at is um, Mark Ritson from Marketing Week. So what he said is there's basically going to be three economic phases of the crisis. So we've got the current crisis right now, which is basically um, looking at, you know, three, 12 or 18 months. or so let's just say until the um, like until September 15, just pick it, pick a date. Um, but basically what he's saying there is that we need to continue to communicate with our clients and be more tactical um, in our marketing efforts. And he said that, um, you know, there's there's kind of three business models or three strategies that can emerge. One of them is that we can flex our strategy, so we can basically um, use our, your, you know, use your existing capabilities um, to to kind of, but flex your business model in order to to continue to do business um, 
and you know for example continue with business as usual but do it more in a digital format and that's what all of the financial planners um, that I've been working with um, have been doing so they're basically migrated into more of a digital role um, you're seeing large supermarkets like Aldi as well trying to figure out well how do we get our digital strategy in place in order to make sure that um, we're delivering against you know our brand values and we're able to deliver what our consumers want during these times of crisis so that's the first one flex and I think we're already doing that the other one during this time has been fix. Like, how do I fix aspects of our business that just isn't working? Um, like, should I revamp my digital presence? Is it really hard to find me online? Um, do we not have a strategy for um, dealing with our clients remotely? Um, and, you know, for example, do I have a chatbot on my, my website and would that be a benefit? Um, can people book online? Um, you know, basically, how easy am I to engage within this new digital world, world and how easy um, is it to um, basically even find me online? I did a quick look around the web. Um, I live in Queen's Park in London and I did a quick look around the web. I searched for a financial advisor in London. And I was surprised to see that the first thing that came up um, within seven miles of me was a building society. And they had an incredibly good like landing page, chatbots, like the whole thing. And it looked like a really strong advice proposition. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that someone would probably go to over and above some of the great financial planning businesses that I know are on my doorstep. Um, because those financial planning businesses, they don't have any Google reviews. They weren't able to be found. Actually, there was, you know, several of them that didn't even have a website accessible through Google Maps. Um, so things like that, they're, they're things that we can do. We can fix the challenges that we have um, in our businesses. And I think now is the prime opportunity to do an audit of your online experience, even your offline user experience, and figure out how can we streamline things, make it tighter and make it better. Um, and then lastly, there are those businesses which some of your clients may, may be in, these, in this case, and it's basically I need to freeze so I'm like a BA and there's not a lot I can do but what I need to do is get out there and make sure that my staff are being looked after and put that into my marketing communication say look this is what we're doing to support our staff and and basically um, continue to make, make sure that you know mental health is being looked after and, and things like that and some advisors have clients in that situation it's about well how do I really best support their needs in times like this um, there are lots and lots of um, brands that got it right. So, for example, you would think that um, Corona would have a be you know, mm -hmm. like what's Corona going to do about coronavirus? Um, their engagement levels actually have gone up because they did nothing. So their strategy was just to say, I'm not going to say anything. There's a whole load of memes going around. I'm just going to leave this. And that's actually improved um, their, you know, um, brand worth because they've just basically continued as business as usual. Um, there was also a, um, a German supermarket that I saw. And what they did is in order to stop people stockpiling, um, they were charging like a normal price for hand sanitizer. But if you bought your second or your third one, they were going to charge you 100 euros. So, you know, it's like thinking about, well, what's going to drive the consumer behavior that I that I want and how am I going to make my brand do the right thing in today's times? Um, so really, I think that this current time that we're in, it's about let's rethink, rebuild, replan. Um, it's an opportunity that we've not had in a while just to hit the pause button and start to think our business in, in that way. Because if I'm completely honest, I don't think everything is going to open up and strategically we're going to be able to deliver against our objectives during this year. I think that 2020 is a write-off for that. We need to be tactical and position our business ready for January 1st next year and just continue to communicate, to do what we're doing and to do it well, but then start to really think and reposition ourselves and strategically operate um, from the new year. Um, then what he says, so this is, is his next thing, is we're then going to go to a state of false numa. And this is when all of the gurus in the world will start to say, so with Corona, this X has changed forever and it will never, ever be the same again. And then you're going to start to see all these people come out with advertisements and marketing that's got people like looking at a new dawn and, you know, all of this. And everyone's going to be so excited because we're finally free and all of that. And that's going to come across as, I believe, incredibly cheesy. Um, but additionally, there's a huge danger because after about three weeks, everyone's going to realize that we are in this recession and who knows how long that's going to be and what the impact is going to be for the long term. So I kind of feel like um, we need to start to focus on that. Um, forget what's going to happen in the, you know, we're all out of lockdown. Let's do a dance about this. Um, really think about, well, you know, how can I communicate with my clients effectively? Um, what can I do? And then really think, think about turning on the strategy in the in the new year. But the challenge that I also, I'm going to speak out of the other side of my mouth, as I often do, um, at mm -hmm. the same time, 
Research shows that if we stop spending during these times, the, um, the basically where we are from brand recognition and brand equity standpoint, that drops. And we have to spend 10 times as much on our marketing in order to get back there. Um, so given that, um, really, if you've got activity planned and you may only be doing things like digital marketing, maybe banner ads or maybe even, you know, placed articles and things like that, see what you can do because providers are looking for content and there's lots of space available. See what you can do to maybe even ramp up a little bit if you've got the budget available um, to maintain, you know, the momentum behind your marketing so then you can come out um, fighting fit at the end of this. So, that, sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, I was going to say that false numer is um, it's really ringing a bell because um, I've just sold my house and actually the surveyor was out yesterday. I did a conversation with him and then I read an article today that was very similar. Um, and they are saying that basically the, the property market, um, you know, the estate agents in particular, are literally in that three week period right now. They are giddy with excitement. Yeah. You know, they have, they've got appointments coming out their ears. Everybody's going nuts. Um, and, you know, the surveyor said yesterday, I'm speaking to a couple of estate agents who get it. They get that this isn't the reality. This isn't sustained. This is that burst of excitement because yeah. some restrictions have been lifted off them. Um, and then I read an article today that kind of followed up on it. And it said, you know, this kind of Woo we're giddy, we're, we're going off is very quickly going to be hit by actually um, the recession's hit. Jobs have been lost. People haven't got the cash. People want, you know, that housing market is going to massively stall. So I think that that um, timeline that you showed there you can quite easily see how it would apply to lots and lots of different industries exactly one thing that um he also said is human nature and i believe neil said that said this last week as well like human nature we're going to revert back to what we were before it's not going to be the seismic change that everyone thinks i think that there will be new normals um, and i think some things will flex but i don't think it's going to be a complete reversal of our behavior from before um so what i've done is in answer to the question like how do i think financial services will change and and basically what are what are consumers looking for um, and how can we address them um, the first one I've got I think eight points and I'll rattle through them um, the first one is the human connection I think that despite the lockdown and despite the fact that we're physically distant from each other I think we're more connected than ever um, so you know basically people are feeling like they're more connected to their um, their clients, their contacts, people within the profession. Um, I'm sitting here drinking out of an Elsa cup. I just noticed, um, you know, so <laughs> making me look a bit more human, right? I've got children. <laughs> I don't just like frozen. <laughs> um, but you know, also um, telecommunications has been rising. Um, you know, people are actually having phone calls again, not just video calls, but phone calls. And and you've seen a massive change that we're having virtual bachelorette parties. You know, happy hours and reunions with friends and family that we've not seen in many many years. So people are actually feeling really really connected. Um, so I think that and people are having meaningful and more deeper conversations. So I think that what that I actually hope it continues. But I think what that means for financial planners is things around you know like lifestyle you know life planning is going to be more important i think clients are willing to have those deeper more meaningful conversations about what's important to them because then my second thing about this new normal my second point is um people are reevaluating what's important to them and i was surprised i've been speaking to a number of people in the local community we actually have a, a whatsapp group on our street um and you know people have been they recorded a song during lockdown like all of this and people are now talking to each other on the street and it's very strange because in london we don't even make eye contact so you know that's been a nice change um but people are reevaluating what's important and i've heard that there are five houses five households within about four blocks of me that have all taken the decision to rent out their london place and move to the country and do like a try before they buy um you know i just want to get out of this i realize that spending time with my family is more important now with flexible working um i can do that um because it's more accepted so um i think that's interesting and i think that helping clients come to those decisions i think that's going to be really important for advisors um next one is we're going to see um greater importance placed on purpose-based businesses so those businesses um, that, you know, it used to just be this millennial thing, like millennials want to go with, you know, businesses that align to their values and things like that. I think it's every everyone. I think we want to work with businesses and brands that are doing good in society. And it can't just be those that have the words, but not the actions. Um, and we're also going to see a huge surge in um, ESG. People are really concerned about that. And I think that was already on the cusp of changing. Um, but if you're a financial planner right now is probably the great a great time to think about getting B Corp status or looking at how you can go carbon, new, carbon neutral, given this kind of shift in mindset for clients. 
Um, there's also another one is, uh, the fourth one is remote business. Um, instead of um, people thinking that you're skiving, people are realizing they can be more productive. And one thing that's quite interesting is that a lot of the large corporates have started to say, the biggest challenge I have now um, is worrying about the burnout rate of my staff because they're getting up, they're sitting at their desks at eight in the yeah. morning, finishing at seven um, without a break. I know um, you sent me a message um, recently, you've done like an eight in hour day. And, you know, I think that people are getting to that point where we're extremely productive and we don't have that commute time. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's going to change. Uh, next one is using apps. So um, basically we're moving away from websites and emails because our inboxes have been flooded and apps, they place less cognitive load on our brains and they've got bigger fonts and less content um, and limited video and sound. Um, and research shows that app downloads during the weekend of the 27th and 28th of March hit record levels of Black Friday last year. Um, so I think that advisors need to start thinking, how do I get an app? And it can't just be a vanity app. It needs to be one that includes things like um, you know, open banking and feeds in. So I've got everything from my insurance policy. So, you know, some of the stuff that you're seeing advisors already starting to do, um, I think that will come to the fore. Um, next one, we're going to see improved client experiences. Back to my earlier presentation ideas. 54% of businesses say that the shift to online has exposed gaps in their client experiences. So I think we're going to see that. And I think some advisors can start to learn from some of the um, disruptive banks. They have really slick onboarding processes, um, a really good um, advisor, sorry, um, client experience. And I think that that's going to really help um, businesses to, to shine. Um, I've got two more. The next one is health and well-being. I think everyone has been um, focused on, you're either going to get fitter or fatter by the end of lockdown. <laughs> and, um, I think a lot of the- Seems to is, week to week. Or, or, you know, <laughs> it depends on where you are on the, on the curve. Um, but there's been like an explosion in like health gurus coming to the fore. And I actually think that, because I've been toying with this idea about, um, you know, creating a financial fitness craze. I think we can start to see that occurring. And I think there's a lot we can learn from um, these influences um, that are, are in the fitness or mental health space and things like that. And we can start to look at perhaps using Instagram more um, as financial advisors and using Instagram stories to educate people. Um, a recent statistic I saw is that 71% of businesses are using Instagram. Um, and additionally, small businesses make up the majority of Instagram advisors and business profiles. So I think that if you really concentrate on your storytelling, I think that could be an avenue um, if it's the right type of clients um, and you've really identified them as being on there. It's an interesting stat because you'd almost think it's the, the reverse in terms of financial services. So I can very well imagine the majority of small businesses, 71% of them being on Instagram, but actually with financial services. So I recently got a, a work Instagram account and I tried to follow yeah. um, other other financial services people or companies and there was very very few to, for, to have them um, you know in the way that you would have a twitter where it's very much for work um there are so so few and um, you're right that actually is instagram as a new sort of medium for financial services to embrace and that ability to almost get that that viral content and to get stuff out there and it's very much personal and for individuals is a massively untapped element i think Exactly. And I've got some examples, if anyone's interested, um, that I've been looking at what, what some firms have started doing during lockdown um, in the States um, on Instagram and educating clients and things like that. So I just think that's quite interesting because when we start to really identify the tribes that we speak best to and that work best with us, um, then you can start to target those micro communities using digital. And I think Instagram is a good one. I think lastly, but not least, is I think our audio preferences have changed. So we've already seen in financial services that more people are um, launching podcasts like yours um, and more people listening to digital radio. Um, in the last couple of weeks, they've seen a 49% month-on-month increase in those people wanting to create podcasts. And the challenge I have is a lot of advisors saying, but what would I say? Um, again, it comes down to really understanding your audience and surveying them, finding out what they want to listen to and then building it and keeping up that momentum. Because one thing um, that I've seen often is people start these projects, they'll do a few and then they'll think, oh, well, it's not working. It's not getting the traction. It's not getting the listens. Um, however, if you look at Joe Wicks, Joe Wicks was creating video content for many years. And in one of his, you probably did this with um, Harrison, in one of his initial PE classes, he basically said, you know what, this has exploded. I've been creating video content for years and years and years, but now, um, 
it's just, it's, you know, it, it's exploded. I've, I'm now targeting millions of people around the world and getting them to, to watch me on a daily basis and to do my exercise programs. He said, but it didn't happen overnight. I've been doing that for a long time. So sometimes you just need to stay true to the path. And then over the long, longer term, you'll be rewarded. <coughs> Sorry. <Oops. laughs> Don't cough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've not been doing my Joe Wicks and I'm quite unfit. <laughs> we have, as you mentioned, we've got a podcast and we were on Pete Matthews' Meaningful Money podcast recently. Um, and he very kindly kind of interviewed Joe and I and then kind of pushed that out to all of his clients. And the philosophy is, you know, Pete's in finance, we're in finance, our clients are kind of the general public, but there's absolutely no element of competition. It's, it's the opposite. It's the more voices that you've got, the more potential there is for somebody out there in the public to hear it and to engage and to get involved. And you just can't get enough of them out there. You know, we're talking about Instagram, we're talking about podcasts and how um, we're great at doing them internal within financial services. You know, we can all talk to one another and hear each other's opinions on things, but getting them out there is still a massive gap. So, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That there's kind of, a, again, a huge untapped potential there. And almost the more of us that do it, the more we help each other out with doing it and kind of getting that yeah. message across. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, also, so I've just realised, and um, scarily, that's already been forty-five minutes. But oh I did see that there was another, there was another slide on your slide. Do you want to? Um, oh no, I can, I can go on without that. That was just. Are you sure? <laughs> uh, basically, say why we should be optimistic um, coming out of this. That there are certain tribes of people that are going to actually um, come out of this with a lot of confidence, um, and they're willing to spend money and they're willing to engage with new brands and propositions. And so, advisors should actually feel excited by this time because it is the opportunity to reset relaunch in certain aspects get rid of services that aren't performing well and really start to put the client at the heart of their proposition i know that advisors do that anyway but they may not articulate it well enough um, in order to get that level of engagement that they desire so i guess um that's kind of what i'd close on yeah and it is it's that pause again isn't it it's that um it's almost it's almost a chance to just spring clean to dust things off to to be critical on your own business to work out which bits aren't really working and to be brave enough to push them aside and to bring up all those ideas that might have been lingering in the back of your mind for such a long time and, and push them to the front and kind of um yeah opportunity is the word that you use it and that's very much one that that we've been saying we think there's a huge opportunity for everybody right now yeah yeah definitely it's good. It's a very nice, positive um, message to end on. Thank you. I can't honestly, I can't believe how quickly that went because actually I've got lots of questions for you. Yeah. But, you know, for like a conference, I'll ask you, I'll ask you them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much for joining us, Abby. That was amazing. And um, yep, the, the um, webinar has been recorded. It'll come out to everybody afterwards. And I just hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and lots to think about there. And do enjoy the sunshine. I'm going to go and run outside and try and even up my tanning now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.